Hello and welcome to ESC TV. My name is Gerhard Hendricks. I'm in Barcelona for the annual ERA meeting uh, and I uh, have the great pleasure to introduce to you two of the uh, well-respected colleagues from, from ERA, which is Hein Heidbüchel from Belgium, the incoming president of the uh, association, and Sabine Ernst from Germany, living in London, working in London. Sabine, Hein, welcome to uh, talk a little bit about day three of this marvelous meeting here in, uh, in Barcelona. We had the late breakers uh, this morning, uh, Hein. Um, I would like to, to start off discussing the two surgical trials uh, that we had the privilege to listen to this morning with quite difficult results. Yeah, it, it was intriguing to see that in one trial uh, there was a clear superiority, so to say, for the um, surgical, the thoracoscopic approach, whereas the other trial uh, showed exactly the reverse. The Zwolle trial from the Netherlands, the scale -F trial, showed that in fact the outcome measured by implantable loop recorders was worse in the patients with thoracoscopic ablation than those with catheter ablation. Now the intriguing feature about that last trial that this was the first time that this sort of randomization was done in first time ablation patients. All trials before, like the other trial we heard here, the FAST trial late um, outcome, was patients in fact who had already had another ablation and were then randomized to another catheter ablation or thoracoscopic. So that was, I think, intriguing from the Zwolle trial where for a first time approach, the catheter ablation came out better than the um, thoracoscopic ablation, both on efficacy, measured, as I said, by implantable loop recorders, and on safety with a very high proportion of major complications in the surgical group. It was really very, very, very interesting to see the, uh, the difficult results that have been presented uh, to us. One that was the long-term follow-up data from the, from the FAST trial with uh, uh, an outcome preference for, for surgery and then the Zwolle trial with an outcome preference for catheter ablation. How would you transfer that in, into a clinical message? I think the clinical message is clear that this is not ripe as a first-line treatment, thoracoscopic uh, ablation, um, that it may have a place in patients that have indeed failed the prior ablation, especially probably when they have other additional risk factors for recurrence, like a history of hypertension, dilated left atrium, as were the inclusion criteria effectively in, in the FAST trial. And so for now, I would restrict it there. We, we also have to say that all these trials are very small trials. FAST trial was 60 patients, the scale of trial was 50 patients. So it's clear that we need larger patient groups to, to have more definitive answers. But uh, it, it is a bailout situation, I would say now, and that's also what the, the, the guidelines, the HRS era consensus document recommends to have it as a as a second phase. I, I think this is a very, very important element to, to point out the size of the trials. Both are, are small trials. If we consider the, the rare incidence of complications, the, the safety uh, solidity of, of the trials is, is uh, a little bit questionable. Mm -hmm. Sabine. Yeah, so I think the same, you know, the yeah. individual operators that are taking part in smaller trials just play a much stronger role. So I think the impact that you know, one or the other percutaneous approach or the surgical approach makes is just more pronounced. So we need to be careful judging and, and extrapolating from that. I, I fully agree with that perspective. We need to jump on now to AXAFA. AXAFA was a pros prospective randomized trial evaluating the role of continuous anticoagulation with a pixaban in patients undergoing catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. What, are the, what were the main outcomes of the trial and what is your perspective? So I think the main outcome and that I think is very reassuring is that there is no difference if you treat on a Pixaban continuous, there is no difference for bleeding, for actually the stroke was equal in both arms. So I think that's a good, good take home message that we 
you know, we can do it safely. We can continue on no anticoagulant um, drugs. Mm -hmm. yeah? And it's actually very much uh, also the same message coming from the Bruce trial. Yeah. The Bruce meta-analysis of the two, Bruce 1 and, and 2, showed essentially the same thing. We can do it, we can do things like invasive catheter ablation procedures or even um, implants from, of, of devices and we can do so and the risk of bleeding is, is yeah, much less if we continue rather than if we stop and bridge patients. That's a very yeah, but, but most the, important but The part. question for me is we can do it, do we have to do it? Um, I, I think that's also what Bruce uh, trial told us that in fact there's no difference between uninterrupted and stopping 36 to 40 hours before. Mm -hmm. So it gives some sort of uh, uh, lenience to the physicians that if you think you have a high risk patient and you have to push anticoagulation till the very end, you can do it. But if you have a lower risk patient, probably you can safely stop 12 hours before. I, and I think the same may be true for the ablation setting. I, I, I agree. The key message that I've taken from Bruce and I think that, that gains benefit uh, for the treatment worldwide is that we have to stop bridging with heparin. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. 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 Yeah. Because there is only yeah. harm bridging with heparin. And this is this is an important step forward as bridging with heparin like five years ago in many institutions, I have to confess, including mine, was, was routine practice. And, and we now know that it only results in harm. We should not do it, but we should stay with with uh, uh, with warfarin or with the, with the dogs. Uh, the question whether or not a small gap may be uh, favorable for the patient still is a little bit open and I, I have the same perspective. The, the, the key question now is we, we can do it but have, do we have to do it and how do we have to do it? There was one more, uh, one additional aspect I think in the Bruce trial that, that is worth reporting and stressing is that whenever additional antiplatelet medication was used, either single or dual, there was an increased bleeding risk. So. It's probably clever to stop aspirin or clopidogrel prior to an implant or a procedure, but to continue on the DOAC or on any anticoagulation, no matter what, and uninterrupted. So that's a very important thing. It's a very important point as well, and it adds to the data that we have seen uh, in recent coronary intervention trials that everything with triple is a little bit difficult, and we should, we should limit the duration of triple therapy uh, with respect to timelines, and we should have strict indications where we where we apply that. It, it, it's in line with these trials, and it's a good message as it will improve the quality of care of patients with cardiovascular uh, disease. And Look, yeah, really it's directly good. applicable for everyone who was listening in the in the session. You can go home and apply that to your patients, and I think that's one of the you know the practical aspect of all of that. It's, it's that's, not that's something a, very a remote, message, but right in the middle of a clear message yeah. that we have to transfer into clinical practice now, quickly. Do we have clear messages from the field of CRT? Uh, we had the the more CRT multi-site pacing trial presented this morning by Christoph Leclerc, focusing on how to handle. Uh, the non-responders with, with advanced uh, programming of the device. What is your perspective on that trial? Well, the, the trial as it was designed was negative. The multi-point pacing was, did not show more responders after an extra six months of uh, pacing therapy than those that stayed on the biventricular pacing. Uh, but the, the interesting uh, post hoc analysis was that if you have a large separation of pacing, then uh, what they call the AS uh, anatomical separation subgroup, but it was a small subgroup that there might be benefit there. And I think this opens up prospective evaluation of that sort of uh, protocol. So what I personally think is it's at least an attempt. So important were this, the numbers in this trial. So 40% of the initially implanted patients were non-responders and they're qualified to be in this sub-trial essentially. Mm -hmm. and, and then Whatever pacing they did as a you know, kind of planned study intervention did not make a difference. So biventricular pacing against this multi-pacing um, yeah. side pacing didn't make a difference. And, and that was a little bit disheartening because we would try to, to do something better for the patient. We tried to get this 40% to improve. However, I think making more efforts to try to, to turn this in a positive way and at least save a couple of them, not so much, I think, of the ones that they tried to pace well, only 40% that then, then actually were able to be paced with this new set-apart um, pacing site. So 
but it's at least something is worth trying and I think that's the message. Absolutely, yeah. they will continue with the trial and there will be further messages coming up from that side. We are at day three now of the first annual ERA meeting here in Barcelona. We moved to March. It has been a, a big jump for the association. You will be the, uh, the next president of our uh, association. What is your summary until now from the Barcelona days for ERA? That, that I'm delighted. I, I, I was concerned becoming president that I had to deal with a very difficult yeah. issue and I think we proved here that ERA is a very strong association. Isn't we that beautiful? It, that's fantastic. We're yeah. in the middle of this meeting. It's the third day and it's still fully packed. People are active here. It's beyond expectations and it gives such, a, yeah, such energy to start my presidency in the future. I really look forward to that. Absolutely. I have the same impression. Wherever you go here in the meeting, you feel the positive vibrations of latest science, of education, of friendship. Mm -hmm. So it's, it has been a great experience. Sabina Hein, thank you very much for staying with us this morning uh, at ESC TV.